Hello and welcome to another episode of Tales, Tales of, of the, the Uncharted, Uncharted Territories. Oh, although probably not for much longer. Oh no, it's going to be the Terrible Territories, or no, what was it again? The the Tormented Territories. That's the one. Sure. <laughs> Tormented Space. Oh, Tales of Tormented Space. Ooh. It's actually really good. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Kaki. I'm Kay, and thank you for joining us for another fanfic. Once again, terraformerscapers.com, the fantastic forum that has served as a, as a, as a home away from home, a port of call for... Tra- nope, sorry, that's Babylon 5. For Farscape, <laughs> Farscape fans for many, many years, once again provides us a, a, a f- what, what they call episode fillers, what I call a very handy organization for fanfics that are safe for K, even this late in the season. Yes, this story is Until Friday, written by... Colonel Crash. Colonel Crash. We've uh, we've read the, some of yes. their stories before. First oh. post is on August 8th, 2002. 2002, 22, yeah, 2002. Yes, oh, Colonel yes. Crash, purveyor of hallucinations, administrator and scaper. Oh. And uh, it takes place after I shrink, therefore I am. Oh, how appropriate. Yes, <laughs> see, because they have them labelled with the episode number. I absolutely love it. And they say, no, this isn't about Aaron's pregnancy. I meant why I wrote this. Oh, oh, procreation is the heading. Okay, so it's got a little segment with a disclaimer, time frame, and procreation. And then he's, and then they say, no, not about pregnancy, but why, why they wrote this. Right. Uh, note to the reader, this is what happens whenever I mow the lawn. My brain wants out doing the artwork and begins coming up with stories. The section above, like procreation, was posted along with the story when it first appeared. And I said, Rogers and Harry wasn't kidding. I got written on Thursday afternoon, and the premise lasted exactly as long as I predicted it would, until Friday's episode aired. So we're talking about 30 hours, uh, hours before I get run over by cannon. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that's such a... It's almost like a sort of zen garden. Then. I guess so, yes. Like writing this fanfic in zen the... Zen garden. In the, oh, <laughs> break my heart, why don't you? <clears throat> All right, let's see. She always seems to have spare time on her hands now. Erin had never realised how much of her time in the past cycles had disappeared into iron-long conversations with John until his presence was no longer tucked alongside her like the comfortable weight of the pulse pistol. (laughs) Woof, that's a metaphor. (laughs) Talking with Pilot absorbed only just so much time and wandering the tears consumed a bit more, but that left the same empty gap in each solar day. She'd finally taken to sitting on the main corridor on Tier 7. It gave her time to think mostly hoping he'd pass by and exchange some small comment that might turn into the opening through which they could establish the beginning of a new relationship. Erin pushed herself to her feet and wandered in the direction of the central chamber. Center chamber, yes. It was pathetic to wait for him, she decided. She was acting like some sort of besotted menial waiting for her latest crush to happen by. Whoa, judgy. The, the chances were equally good that she'd run into John if she just wandered around Moya long enough. Although it would be more effective asking Pilot to find him for her. It was out of the question... Oh. Although it would be more effective, there. asking Pilot to find him for her was out of the question. John had made it very clear that talk alone wasn't going to resolve anything. But he hadn't told her what act of contrition she'd have to perform to break down his mistrust. The constant grumbles from her stomach told her that she'd skipped one meal too many, and she'd have to convince the old woman to give her something to eat. Naranti had treated her with cool disdain at first and had completely ignored her presence since she'd knocked her senseless the first day of their reunion aboard Moya. Yeah, that's not a great first impression. (laughs) Unless John was in the room. Then the woman would simper and laugh, prancing around him like a courtesan, Mm. lifting her skirts to move quickly between them. Edron frowned in annoyance. The mere memory of the gliding figure... Yes, gliding. Shouldering her away from John enough to make her want to hit the woman again. Hey. I mean, I can imagine that, like, you know, she is, like, grating at times. Yeah, she has the personality equivalent of what the Germans call a Backpfeifengesicht, <laughs> which is a, a face in need of a fist. Ew. She stopped for a micro. Wow. No, hold on. I'm falling into this trap. I'm not going to... I'm on Team Naranti. I keep forgetting. I'm actually on Team Naranti. She stopped for a micro and then moved more slowly as she approached the open door to the center chamber, hearing the low rumble of John's voice and the faster, more excitable tones of Naranti. He laughed shortly, <laughs> the humorless bark that seemed to have taken over his life le- recently. Erin thought of this all-too-rare chuckle and felt a sharp pang of regret in her stomach, muscling all hunger aside. She paced forward more quietly, stepping with care to the edge of the door to watch before disturbing them. Oh, creeper. 
John sat on the edge of the table, looking down at his hands. The old woman rubbed his shoulders possessively, then leaned alongside him with a deft motion scattered dust in his face. Aaron started to move forward, an angry objection on her lips, but John jerked once, then looked up with a smile of delight. That was the look she wanted to see for so many long days and nights, and could no longer generate. Aaron shifted her weight back onto her rear foot, preparing to leave them to their distractions, then froze as Naranti moved around the table. John got to his feet, and she slid into his arms. They began to dance, whirling around the chamber, her faded skirts billowing out as they spun, looking blissful and pleased. John's eyes were closed to slits, his head tilted slightly to one side as he smiled into the beaming, wrinkled face, pulling her closer as they moved around the heating unit to spin into the open area in the centre of the floor once more. Aaron gnawed at her lower lip, debating whether she should go forward or retreat, uncertain exactly why John was letting this happen. She finally settled on leaving them alone with their odd, silent dance and turned away. You're so radiant, he said behind her. I love you. Aaron spun around, afraid he had seen her and was mocking her as retaliation for her spying. John had lowered his head to face the beaming, wrinkled face, but his eyes were closed now. He was seeing something other than Noranti's aged features, and Aaron was suddenly enraged. She stood and shook with anger, her hands pressing down on the butt of the pulse pistol, teetering on the thin edge of an explosion. John spun Noranti around once more and then stumbled. The old woman pulled away from him quickly, using his reaching hands to guide him back to his seat on the table. Aaron turned and hurried away from the chamber, certain he was about to come out of his drug-induced visit to some other time and place. She hurried toward the den to ask Pilot to locate Dargo, a plan for revenge forming rapidly in her mind. It took two entire solar days before the sequence of events she needed, and one surprise revelation all fell into place. Aaron smiled with satisfaction as she ran headlong through the corridors, following a chirping DRD to get to the center chamber in time. She skidded to a halt while the DRD... Uh, Reconnoitered? Reconnoitered, yeah, Reconnoitered. it's like doing Never. reconnaissance. Oh, reconnoitered for her. Never heard that one before, word before. Then bolted inside the empty room when it squealed and sailed away. Oh, thank you, pilot, she said shortly and closed her comms. She chose a dark corner and folded herself into a seat, trying to look as if she'd been there for arms. Oh yeah, that old trick. Uh, it was barely 100 microts and hardly enough time to regain her breath before John walked quickly into the chamber and looked around. Granny, he called, then spun around to leave. She's busy doing something else right now, Aaron said calmly. Did you want something to eat? She picked up some sort of plant from the centre of the table and waved its leafy greenery at him. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Did you want something? And just grabbing the, the nearest Leak, noun yes. that you can find. <laughs> uh, no, she had something I meant to get from her earlier. I'll find her later. Thanks, Aaron. He wandered closer, looking uncertain. You just sitting in here? No, I, I thought I might be able to talk to you if I waited here long enough. Oh, okay, so I started off like she was pretending to be caught, but she's actually, like, really sincere. No, yeah. I thought I might be able to talk to you if I waited here long enough. She held her fist out toward him, fingers down, and waited silently. John looked puzzled, but eventually reached out and placed his palm under hers. She dropped the nut-like bulb into his hand. That's what you wanted from the old woman, isn't it? John licked his lips, turning the bulb over and over in his fingers. You took this out of my quarters, didn't you? You stole it. The obviously mindless accusation was so unbelievable that her self-control snapped, anger flaring inside. Erin jumped to her feet and headed for the door, glancing back once to make sure he knew she was angry. John hadn't moved. He was standing with one thigh leaning against the edge of the table, with something very much like hunger in his expression as he stared at the bulb in his fingers. Air anger at John shifted, mutating into another hot surge of fury aimed at Noranti. She drifted slowly back towards him, unseen by the eyes that were fixed on the betrayer's gift. Not everything I do is meant to hurt you, John, she said quietly. He jumped, noticing her return for the first time. One of the DRDs found it in the maintenance hangar last night. And you came charging up here to confront me? It's my life, Aaron. He pushed away from the table and started to leave, his fist closed tightly around his possession. She stepped in front of him, blocking his way. The DRD took it to Pilot, who recognised it, and notified Dargo, because he is now captain. Hmm. Dargo knew what it was immediately, but no one was sure who it belonged to at that point. The struggle to maintain an even, unemotional voice was making it difficult to remember everything she wanted to say. John. Dargo knew about it because the Luxons used the distillate when a battle is hopeless. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it's like, it's like a really <coughs> chill berserker potion. <coughs> <coughs> or it's just like, you know, 
morphine. Like, you know, we know we know it dulls the senses. It's <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. It's just, we don't care about that we're gonna die anymore. It's just soup's mellow. Yeah. No, it's all about the journey, man. <laughs> it's not it's not the destination. I mean it's, it seems to be more Valium like than I mean, especially mental uh, Valium, you know. Mm, just yeah. like yeah, I don't care about it anymore. So the muscles in his jaw bunched as he clamped it shut, as obstinate as ever. The familiar expression reassured her that the John Crichton she loved was still very much in resonance within that body. You don't understand, she asked cautiously. They use it so dying doesn't frighten them so much. That seems reasonable. He stepped to one side, trying to go around her. They use it before they go into a battle that cannot be won, because hyper-rage is more effective and lasts longer if they don't remember the families they will leave behind and aren't distracted by thoughts of love and caring. They have, on occasion, managed to reverse tactically impossible situations this way, but always at a horrible cost. Dargo approached me about it first, thinking I had been using it, but I suggested that perhaps Naranti had given it to you. He turned away from her and went to sit in one of the dark corners, pulling one knee up to his chest. She did, didn't she? John shrugged. It helped. Not in the long run, she went to sit neck near him, choosing a seat a little more than a motra away, not too close to him. What do I have to do, John? You said, come back when I get my story straight. What do you want from me? He shrugged again, rubbing at his temple. Do you want me to break my promises? Promises, promises, promises. I am not certain how that will convince you or anyone else that I can be trusted. There are too many pieces missing, Aaron. I don't know how you can trust Scorpius. I don't know where you've been or what you've been doing. I don't really know why you changed your mind or why you came back. You've given me nothing. He shifted the bulb from one tightly clenched fist into the other, then rubbed his other temple with a freed hand. She considered it, tumbling the different possibilities around in her mind. All right. Part of the reason I trust Scorpius to do what he says he'll do is because before I agreed to argue on his behalf, he promised me that he would take the clone out of your mind. I'm the one who told him that Harvey was in there. Whoa. <sighs> you did that? He said. He was shaking his head, looking disappointed. What was wrong with that? Please don't tell me you wanted to keep him in there. Her throat tightened at the prospect that he would have wanted to retain the clone. Breathing became a struggle. No, I didn't, John admitted. But you have to understand that the entire time you were off doing whatever you were doing, he made a frustrated gesture, the only people I had to talk to were the pilot poster child for AARP. Quick mental notes to look that up. Yeah. A miniature version of Hervey the Love Bug and Harvey. He was far from my first choice for cellmate Aaron, but at least he stuck around. The sliding glance out of the side of his eyes to see her reaction was the only thing that prevented her from storming out of the chamber that instant. Aaron sat rigidly still, remembering why she had arranged this confrontation and letting her concern for John override her anger for a second time. Not nice, she finally answered, her tone making it clear that she was referring to his cruel comparison. John shrugged again. Do you want him back? I'm sure Scorpius can put it back if you'd like. I didn't say that. What made you think I'd be in such a hurry to yank him out? Or maybe Scorpius wanted him out for some reason? He raised his eyebrows, jerking his head at her to ask if she'd taken that into account. I knew you'd want him out because I saw the look on John Crichton's face when he had his mind to himself for the first time in cycles, she said with force. Different guy. No, he isn't, she yelled, banging her fist down on the table. Whoa. It had the effect she wanted. John straightened up from his careless slump and began paying more attention to her. There is only one John Crichton, as far as I'm concerned. There never was more than one. He was a bit, she searched for a word, <laughs> spread around, but there was only one. John bit his lower lip, then finally nodded. I is that enough for a start? For a start, he agreed. Some of the tension left his body. What do you want from me now? What will it take for you to stop using this? She reached slowly for his wrist, forcing him to turn his fist over and then waiting for him to open his tightly clenched fingers on his own. It helps, he repeated. He stared intently as she took it out of his hand and placed it on the table. Then I'll leave Moya if you want me to, if that's what it takes. She waited, all sound except the thump of her heart fading as she waited for his answer. Time crawled, the pulse in her ears slowing to a muffled th thump as he rubbed his forehead with the heel of his hand. No, John shook his head. I don't want you to leave. He looked into her eyes for the first time in days. I want you to stay, Aaron. Time spooled out before her again, sound returning in a rush. His blue eyes didn't waver as they looked at each other. Aaron let her breath out slowly, trying not to gasp with relief. I don't really need to have this, he asserted. 
John rolled the bulb about on the table with his finger. It's just kind of nice from time to time. His eyes wandered away from hers, crept back slowly. Then don't use it for a while, she suggested lightly. Just prove that you don't need it. She tried to keep the suggestion from becoming a challenge. If he felt pushed, she knew he'd get stubborn. Hmm. Sure, he slid it across to her. How long is a while? I mean, how long to prove that I just use it when I want to feel a little better? Erin considered the question. She hadn't expected this part of the conversation to occur, and it was the only piece of information that she hadn't mapped out in advance. Hmm. Pilot says we'll cross out of the uncharted territories and into the fringes of tormented space in five solar days. How about five days? Until Friday. No problem. He was staring at the bulb laying next to her fingertips. (laughs) Until what? Five days was a work week on Earth. Friday was the last day of the work week, and after that we had two days to do what we wanted and have fun. So, until Friday. Mm, That sounds good, she agreed. Pleased to have this Earth-based nonsense rattling around her again. (laughs) She fingered up the drugs and tucked them into her pocket, watching his gaze follow her movements. John rubbed his temple again. John, look at me, please. He redirected his attention willingly. His eyes were bloodshot and seemed a bit unfocused. How long have you been using the laka? I don't know. He scratched lightly at his cheekbone. A while. She gave it to me after Chian and I had that problem with the game. You have a headache? He nodded, rubbing an eye. How many of these things did she give you? I lost track. He seemed distracted now, but not annoyed by her probing. How much have you used, John? How often? Twice a day? Three times? Four? He shrugged, starting to look uncomfortable. More? Sometimes. He scratched at the back of his neck. Oh, John, Aaron sighed. She got up and went to stand behind him, rubbing the back of his neck with both thumbs. You've already started withdrawal. He jumped when she touched him, but didn't fight the massaging fingers. This is going to take a while. We'll have to find out how much Noranti gave you. Probably about, she gave him a small shove against his shoulders, five days? (laughs) Look, he shook his head. Aaron activated her comms, then called, Dargo. Yes, Aaron. Uh, Can you get Noranti for us? She's got John addicted. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and we'll just, like, pull all her arms and legs off and just throw her out the airlock, shall we? A hiss of anger ripped through the comms. <sighs> I'll head right out. Is everything else all right? Aaron was working her thumbs into his neck again. Well, John had begun rubbing his forehead almost nonstop. Everything but that. I'll make sure he gets back to his quarters. I'll let you know after I've talked to that witch, the deep voice growled over the comms, which will be right before I kill her. Is this going to be bad? John mumbled. Mm, Define bad. She wanted to laugh at his dejected slump. The relief that he was talking to her again washed all other concerns out of her mind. Bad as in, this is going to hurt, isn't it? Mm, No, but hurting might be preferable to what is going to happen. Let's just say that if you had a ship that we could fly only if we had your DNA, we're looking at having a five-year supply here soon. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) She did laugh that time. The only reaction possible as he began shaking his head and muttering, Oh, frail, oh, frail, oh, frail, into his hands. John finally raised his head, staring blindly at the wall in front of him. You must think I'm an idiot, he said. He sounded so angry again. Aaron took another firm hold on her own temper, reminding herself that the first effects of withdrawal were very likely already making him uncomfortable and therefore belligerent. She pulled the laka distillate out of her pocket, examining it as she answered. There is no way that you could have known what this poison would do to you. It's not your fault. She tossed it accurately into the waste funnel. It spun around the bowl once and dropped down the pipe, pinging and rattling for several microns before the sound disappeared completely. Why don't you go to your quarters? You're going to want to be there most of the next few days. John pushed himself to his feet, nodding. Thank you, Aaron. He walked unsteadily towards the door, looking a little forlorn. John, he turned, waiting silently. Would it be all right if I stayed with you through this? Just to help get you things and maybe to talk when you're feeling up to it? The tension wasn't as bad as when she'd asked him if he wanted her to leave Moya, but she knew that in some respects this answer was almost more important. A small smile appeared, the first glimmer of the beaming grin she'd come to miss. Ah, we kind of nice, he admitted, and waited for her. Maybe just to start. We'll take it one step at a time. She tried not to skip in excitement as she moved to sit beside him. (laughs) Start with the next five days and then see what happens, he agreed. Until Friday, she tried the new word. He nodded again. Aaron started to put her arm around his waist to help him, but John pulled away from her. 
She swallowed hard against a sudden lump in her throat. It was just a first step, after all, she reminded herself. Aww. It was too much to expect. He was asking her something. She shook herself mentally and tried to listen. What? She finally had to ask. Dargo said he'd go get Noranti. Where is the old hag? Uh, I wanted to talk to you without her butting in, so I asked the captain if he had any ideas how to get her out of the way. She took her his hand and pulled him back into the center chamber. We came up with the idea together. John's hand tightened around hers as they peered out of the viewport There's towards no, where she was no. pointing. Three or four motors above them, Noranti floated peacefully outside Moya, tethered by a long cable that was being slowly reeled in by Dargo. No! I was only joking about spacing her yeah, she's probably got put it back in her uh, uh, they don't, vacuum coma again. They don't know about the vacuum coma. Yes, I mean, John might have told them. Like, right. I mean, I mean uh, of course they know about the vacuum coma. They saw her fly floating around the window the previous time. Yeah, but Dargo can do that. He might assume, oh, they clearly can, can handle uh, that. But yeah. if, if she can only survive that if she's like soups high on drugs, then now they've <laughs> okay. just kicked her out. Yeah. And there, there is a dead grandsicle coming back in. Like, <laughs> oh, didn't work this time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, bud. you got to <laughs> soak him in lye first. <laughs> Wow, what an image. Good place for her, John growled. His look of angry satisfaction turned suddenly to one of alarm. He belched softly. Oh, brother, let's go. You're sure you want to help with this? It's not exactly the nicest way to spend a week. I'm sure. He still wouldn't let her slide under his arm, but he let her hold his hand all the way to his quarters, and for a long time after that. Oh, oh. oh that's really nice. And this concludes Until Friday by Colonel Crash. Thank you so much. That was a that was a really nice scene. Yes, especially Granny floating outside the window. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very concerned for her. I mean, this is clearly like in an alternate universe where people are open about their feelings and sort of communicate oh, well. And like, dearly me, yes, that's that doesn't sound like Farscape at all, like does it? Yeah, no, no, but it is an alternate universe where they did just <laughs> chuck a living person out of an airlock, naively well. thinking. That, yeah. Oh, no, don't worry, the execution has already taken place, apparently. Yes, which kind of, like, le leads to the fact that, like, why did she have to ask him to find uh, Noranti? It's a little bit of a weird inconsistency, you know, so, like, when she com when she calmed John telling him that he, uh, just after I killed the hack, you know, it's like, it's a bit weird, but it's still funny. <laughs> I thought it was a very good story. Thank yes. you so much, Colonel Crash. And the, the whole community at Terra Firm Escapers. Join us again next week as we return to a new episode of Farscape, which is 409, which... It's one of the... Well, it's either the one with, with Perfect in it or with, with Clam in it. Okay. We'll find out. Let me see. Yeah, we'll find out. We'll find that next week. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kaki. I'm Kay. Bye-bye. Zvai-bye. No. Me a Woody. No. There. That's the one.